Today's lectures are on Europe in the Middle Ages. We've been discussing Europe a lot lately. Uh, we talked about the philosophers. Most of them were from Europe. Uh, we've already talked about the Roman Empire and the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 CE. And we have moved into the Byzantine Empire. If you remember that Byzantine is in Eastern, is the Eastern half of the Roman Empire. Uh, this lecture is more over the social um, history and political history of Europe in the Middle Ages. Middle Ages time period is the fall of the Roman Empire um, up until about the arrival of Christopher Columbus. Okay, we're going to take a look at a map of Europe in 1050 CE. Uh, let's look around and see what's going on in Europe. If you look at uh, where the former uh, Roman Empire was, the western half, uh, which had, we learned, turned into the Kingdom of the Franks. Uh, that's where Charlemagne ruled. Here is the Holy Roman Empire. If we look to the east, you will see the Byzantine Empire which is the eastern half, and you should think about words like Constantinople, Constantine, um, Eastern Orthodox Christian Church, when you think of the Byzantine Empire. For um, the Middle East, the Muslims are still uh, ruling, uh, known as the Caliphates, Muslim Caliphates. They're also in North Africa, and they are also called the Moors in Spain. If you look at Italy, where the Pope is, uh, in the Papal States, you will see that they are all broken up, and it's going to remain this way until about the 1800s. We'll begin by talking about population. So in the early Middle Ages, there's a small population. By the end of the Middle Ages, which we refer to as the High Middle Ages, there's a population increase. The uh, population of Europe has almost doubled from 38 million to 74 million. But why? One reason is less invasion. There's no more nomadic invasions. Uh, the Huns, the Visigoths, and the Goths have already settled in, have already blended in with uh, the European culture. Um, another reason is increased food production, and the, there's three causes for increased food production. One is climate change, second is uh, new technology, and the third is clearing of new land. This image represents technology. This is called a karuka. It is a heavy wheeled plow, has an iron plowshare, uh, and this is what revolutionized the Middle Ages. Here is another technological ex uh, example. This is a horse collar, and to the right is horse shoes. The reason for the horse collar is so that when you pull the horse back, you do not choke it. And the reason for the horseshoe is so when the horse steps on the ground, it can have more uh, stability and can also pull more weight. And these two inventions is what helped increase agricultural production during the Middle Ages, allowing for more food to be produced, which in turn meant an increase in population. So due to the iron plowshare, more land could now be planted. There's also a change from a two-field to a three-field system, and this helped increase variation. So if you notice the image, in field one, uh, it's wheat, field two is barley, and field three is fallow. It's where the animals graze, and so there's a constant rotation. Uh, and, and the field three that's left empty, what's happening is that the animals are fertilizing it. They're also using their hooves to move the soil around to soften the soil. And it sits for up to about a year, and it gains um, nourishment while it sits. And the big idea behind this is that more land is being used. Here's a more detailed example of the three-field system. So if you would like, at this time, you can pause the video and read all the little information boxes. Okay, now we'll be talking about the farming uh, system used during the Middle Ages. It's called the manorial system. And what a manor is, it's an agricultural estate or a, pe or a piece of land that's run by a lord and worked by peasants. So the lord owns the land and the peasants work the land. 
Uh, one half to one third of the land would be used for the Lord and the rest would be used for the peasants. The peasants had to work both sides of the land and they also had to give a portion of their own harvest to the Lord. Um, serfs were bound to the land. They had to ask the Lord uh, permission to leave. They could not marry anyone outside. And by the year 800, 60% of Western Europe Europeans were serfs. They also had to pay the Lord's rent. They also had to give the church part of their harvest. And in addition to all of this, they also had to work three days a week for the Lord. Peasant life. So peasants lived in simple mud houses. Their life was based on the seasons. Uh, they didn't always work. Uh, the Catholics have about 50 holidays. Um, village uh, church was the center of their life. Their diet consists of vegetables, cheese, nuts, berries, fruits, eggs, chickens, and owl. Owl is a type of beer. Women worked and raised children, and every day they had to make bread. And so, and so women um, always had to be in the kitchen, constantly checking on the bread to see if it rise and uh, while they raise the children. Now we will talk about the economics of the Middle Ages. Uh, let's focus on trade. So trade slowed during the early Middle Ages, but it revived by the end of the 10th century. Um, and so that's when the High Middle Ages begin. Money and money economy is developed. It replaces barter. Barter is where you trade. I'll give you 100 pounds of salt for 100 pounds of gold. Uh, a money economy is based on currency. Uh, and so this leads to the rise of commercial capitalism. Capitalism is when you have a market based on private sellers. And so uh, you have a group of people, we call them businessmen today. People invest in trade and uh, goods to make a profit. And so you have people now who are employed just to figure out who's trading with who. And two of the trading capitals were Venice and Flanders. Venice is in Italy. Uh, they traded with the Byzantine Empire. And they had uh, a fleet of ships in Flanders. Flanders is it, traded with Northern Europe, um, Scandinavia, France, Germany, and England. And let's go ahead and look at some images of Venice and Flanders. This is uh, the city of Venice. Venice is known as the city of canals. This is an aerial view. It was taken from um, space. If you look closely, you can see all the little canals that are going through the city blocks. This has access all around it to um, the Mediterranean. And so Venice was a very important training center. And Venice is in northern Italy. Flanders is also an important trade area. It's located in northern Europe. Uh, if you look, it's in modern-day Belgium. Uh, it's in northern Belgium. Brussels is the capital of Belgium today. And Flanders traded mostly with the northern sections of Europe. And they also were, like Venice, were uh, one of the trade cities during the Middle Ages. Growth of cities. So there's more trade um, occurring, and so merchants need access to more people, so they start settling uh, in the old Roman cities. Some build new cities outside of the castles uh, along trade roads. And these new cities, the people who live there, are known as the bourgeoisie, which means middle-class people who lived in towns. Um, and how this relates to the government, so kings had to give the merchants uh, more freedoms in order so that they can trade. And so eventually cities develop their own uh, city governments and patricians were elected. Remember, patricians are the upper class and usually they were uh, elected through fraudulent means. So what was daily life like in these cities? Well, women could trade and be independent and um, people started to develop guilds. Guilds are business associations. And in these guilds, they would set standards for a product's quality, method, and determine the price. They also determined how many people can do a specific trade. And so they were regulating themselves. And there was a process of, of gaining expertise. You would have to be an apprentice, and then you would have to be a journeyman. Now, cities were very overcrowded. They were tightly filled due to the narrow streets. They were dangerous because if something caught on fire, then everything caught on fire. 
They were dirty. They were smelly. People would throw their waste out the windows. And it was very polluted. And so you can imagine how this contributed to the spread of disease. Okay, let's talk about the papal monarchy. Since the 5th century, popes have been claiming power um, in Italy, and they gained territories in central Italy uh, known as the Papal States. The church was involved in the feudal system. Remember, we talked about feudalism. Uh, you would have your kings, you would have your lords, your knights, and your serfs. And so church officials received their positions from nobles. Those are people outside of the church. They're wealthy people. Um, lords were chosen for political reasons, so they weren't choosing necessarily the best person for the job. Uh, and so there is a call for the reform of the papacy. They didn't want the lords or ladies choosing. Um, and the way it would work is the lord would give the individual a ring and staff, and it represented the authority invested by the church, and this was known as lay investiture. Taking a look at the map again, uh, let's remind ourselves where the Papal States are. And so here they are in Central Italy. Okay, so we talked about the Papal Reform. So uh, let's talk about who's involved. Pope Gregory the Seventh in 1073 sought to end this practice to free the church. Uh, and he has a conflict with Henry the Fourth of Germany. And this conflict is known as the Investiture controversy and there's not going to be an agreement until the year 1122 at the Concordat of Worms and um, here there's an agreement between a new pope and a new king and the new agreement is that a bishop would first be elected by the church and he would pay homage to the king as his lord and then the king in turn would vest him with the symbols of temporal office then a church representative would also invest him with spiritual office so you're kind of having to do double duty. And so the church uh, becomes supreme. Uh, Pope Innocent III increased papal power by using something called the interdict. And he reigned uh, as pope from 1198 to his death in 1216. And he forbade priests from giving sacraments, uh, Christian rites such as uh, communion or the Eucharist. Uh, to certain groups of people. So he would use the interdiction to, uh, to force Philip Augustus to take back his wife and restore her as Queen of France when he had thought of leaving her. And so uh, he either had to take back his wife or he would have to face the people. And so he chose to go ahead and take back his wife. During this time period, there's also a call for new religious orders. There's a new wave of religious enthusiasm in the church. The Cistercians were unhappy with Benedictine monastery. Uh, I had told you in the last class that monks were living like ordinary people. And so the Cistercians were very strict. They called for more prayer, for more labor, and they would go outside the monastery to preach to the common folk. Uh, women. So most nuns were from uh, aristocratic families, uh, so they would be upper-class women. One of the most famous nuns was Hildegard of Bingers. She was a nun, a composer, and she was also an abbess, which means she was the head of an abbey or a convent of nuns. In the 13th century, there were two other new religious orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans. The most famous Franciscan was St. Francis of Assisi, and uh, they advocated to live a simple life and for monks to return to a life of po poverty, and they traveled the world to spread their religion. The most famous Dominican was Dominique de Guzman, and they wanted to free the Church of Heresy, which is the denial of basic church doctrines. And they believed that to also live a poor and simple life. This takes us now to the Inquisition, which dealt with heretics. Um, and it was led by the Dominicans, as we said, that their main goal was to prosecute heresy. Um, and if people were accused, they had to perform public penance and uh, other possible punishments. By the year 1252, if they did not confess, they were automatically executed. People of the 13th century believed heresy was a crime against God and against humanity. And they felt force was justified 
as they were saving damned souls. The church played a prominent role in daily life. People um, had to do sacraments uh, from birth to death, such as baptism, marriage, and the Eucharist. There's also a veneration of saints uh, who were whole, uh, men and women considered holy. Virgin Mary was the most revered. You can look at her image, and this is a medieval image of the Virgin Mary. Holy cities, you have Jerusalem, you have Rome, where the body of St. Peter and St. Paul are located. You also have Santiago de Compostela, where the body of Apostle James is said to be. Uh, something else that's important are relics. Relics are bones of saints or objects connected with saints that were considered holy and worthy of worship. And people believed they could produce miracles. Although many historians believe the Middle Ages was backwards in comparison to the classical period of the Greeks and Romans, there is a flourishing of some aspects of the culture, especially in academia. You have the rise of universities in Bologna, Italy. You have the University of Paris, which uh, was in Northern Europe. And then around the year 1150, many people, have, instead of going to the University of Paris, they went to Oxford, England. By the year 1500, there were 80 universities spanning Europe. Uh, let's talk about curricula. Uh, you have grammar, rhetoric, logic, uh, arithmetic, which is math, geometry, music, and astronomy. And this is where we get the, the modern-day degrees we still use, the bachelor's, the master's, and lectures. Uh, many went on to study law, medicine, theology, that's the study of religion and God. And after about 10 years, you can get a doctor's degree. Here's an image of Oxford University, and you can see the, the Gothic architecture. Continuing on with culture of the Middle Ages, scholasticism influenced theology, and it was the harmonizing of Christian teachings with philosophy, and we talked about that during our Sophie's World discussions, uh, because Aristotle's teachings upset Christians. Uh, you also have St. Thomas uh, Aquinas, uh, who sought to reconcile reasoning and theology. They also have the use of vernacular language. Uh, Latin was the official language of the church. Uh, vernacular language is Spanish, French, English, German. It's language used every day. The most uh, famous uh, piece of literature using vernacular language is Song of Roland in the year 1100, uh, and it is a heroic poem. It is also the most famous example of Chazon de Gès, which is French for a heroic poem or a heroic deed, and what we commonly think about heroes. You also have troubadour poetry, uh, which entails knights, romance, and bravery. Here is the image of St. Thomas Aquinas. For architecture, many churches are built in the 11th and 12th century. Looks like I'm missing a one on the 11th. Uh, in the Romanesque style, which is a basilica shape, uh, and they were dark. Uh, the other appearance of architecture is uh, Gothic in the 12th century, uh, with stained glass windows, and they reflected an upward movement towards the heavens. And let's take a look at the images. So these are stained glass windows. Notice the detail in the windows. And many churches still have the stained glass windows today. Okay, I've showed most of my classes the Fleas on Rats video. If I haven't, remind me to show it to you. But you have the Black Death arriving in the late Middle Ages. And it's the most devastating natural disaster in European history. And estimates vary on the number of de uh, deaths. It's somewhere between half to two-thirds of the population died of Europe between 1347 and 1351, and there are consequences of the Black Death. People believed it was a godsend, that God was punishing them for their sins. Some people believe uh, that it was the Jews, and so it was anti-Semitism feelings by accusing the Jews that they had poisoned the wells. Uh, trade declined because you have so many people dying. You don't have as many uh, workers in order to produce your goods, and serfdom also declines due to falling prices. Also in the end of the Middle Ages, you have a decline of church power. 
Popes were struggling over power with the head of the monarchy. At the time, is King Philip IV, who wanted to tax the clergy. The clergy is a part of the church. Um, the Pope was Pope Boniface VIII, and he believed that the state could not tax the clergy without consent from the Pope, because that the Pope was supreme over both church and state. And so the king ordered the Pope to stand trial, and the king t moves a new Pope, to Avignon. There's a lot of criticism about this and there's going to be seven popes in Avignon between the years 1309 to 1377 when finally Pope Gregory XI returned the seat of the Pope to back to Rome. This next section is very important, the Great Schism. What is a schism? A schism is a division between two opposed parties. And so what's going to happen is uh, Pope Gregory XI dies and an Italian pope named Pope Urban VI is elected. And the Frenchmen do not like him. And so they want a French pope. And so they elect their own pope and his seat is going to be at Avignon where Pope Gregory the Eleventh and his predecessors were for the period of 1309 to 1378. And so they choose a Frenchman, and so now there's two popes. And this is the beginning of the Gracism in the years 1378 to 1417, and it's going to last uh, about 60 or so years, and it's going to divide Europe, and it's going to damage the credibility of the Church, until finally a council in Switzerland ends the schism, by electing one pope that they can agree on. Okay, we're moving on to the Hundred Years' War, which is a, a really, really big war between uh, England and France. And so, uh, besides having plagues, economic crisis, and the decline of the Catholic Church, the Middle Ages also faced war and political problems. And what had ha began the Hundred Years' War is that the King of England, King Edward III, um, had inherited a, an estate in France in an area known as Normandy. And under the system of feudalism, if you own a land, then that means you pay homage to the king. But Edward III refused to pay homage to King Philip VI of France because he believed he was the rightful heir to the French throne. And so he refused to pay homage, and so uh, war was declared on France because uh, France uh, confiscated his land. Uh, and so during the Hundred Years' War, there's a use of knights, cavalry, and foot soldiers, which were peasants. The first battle is in 1346 at Crecy, which is in northern France. And in 1415, um, the Battle of Agnicourt, which is also in France, this is where the French are ultimately defeated uh, when King Henry V beats 1,500 French knights. A very important and prominent woman of the, of the Hundred Years' War is Joan of Arc. And she was born in 1412 to peasants in France. She was religious. She said to have visions to free, free France. And so she was a, an advocate of France winning the Hundred Years' War. And she traveled to Orleans with the French court. But she was sentenced to death for witchcraft, uh, for her having her visions, and she was called a heretic. Technology used during the Hundred Years' War, there's cannons, there's longbow arrows. Keep in mind, where did they get the gunpowder to explode the cannons? And it was from the Chinese. After the Hundred Years' War, there are political issues both in England and in France. In England, there were some issues in getting a male hair, and so it leads to the War of the Roses. There's factions fighting for power. Henry Tudor, uh, who later be known as Henry VII, comes to power, uh, and there are no private armies. In France, there's a new sense of nationalism after the war. Uh, King Louis XI uh, rules from 1461 to 1483. The, he enacts the Taille which is an annual direct tax on land or property, which increases state funds. So you're probably wondering what's going on with Spain during all this time. We've been talking about England and France and 
Um, so we talked about the Arab Muslims had took control of Spain by the year 725. Um, but during the Middle Ages, there are a rise of uh, Christian kingdoms. The two most famous ones are Aragon and Castilla. Isabella of Castilla and Fernandad of Aragon married in 1469, unifying Spain. Um, because they were so prominent and they were able to come together, they were able to push their agenda of Catholicism. And in doing so, they expelled all Jews in 1492 and all Muslims in 1502. This is a map of the Iberian Peninsula in 1300. Notice the Kingdom of Castilla is fairly large. Also, uh, Aragon, the one it's going to join with, is also fairly large. And it looks like the Moors, um, the Muslims are known as Moors, has receded just to the tip of southern Spain, but that they're still very prominent in northern Africa. You can see here and here. Here's an image of Fernandad and Isabella, and as I said, they're the ones who will unite to push the Jews and the Muslims out of Spain and to establish a, a long-standing tradition of Christianity in Spain until modern day. Okay, we have arrived at the end of the Middle uh, Ages, and this is known as the High Middle Ages, and at the end, there's a, many empires are lacking a strong monarchy. The Holy Roman Empire, after the year 1438, is going to be controlled by the Habsburg dynasty. The Germanic kingdoms are going to be divided into 100 states. And remember, we talked about the effects of regionalism, having many different um, kings in such a close area. In Poland, nobles win the right to elect their king. In Russia, the Mongols continue to rule until 1480, when a Russian prince, Ivan III, uh, gains power. And so this is the end of the Middle Ages.